Hello and welcome to this video on the PN junction and the diode. In this video we're going to introduce the topic of semiconductors and the material that semiconductors are constructed from. We're then going to apply this to the idea of the PN junction and also to simple semiconductor devices. In this video we're going to touch on the topic of diodes or junction diodes but in future videos we'll also mention Zener diodes, bipolar junction transistors and junction field effect transistors or FETs. To begin with though I want to just touch briefly on an introduction to the topic of semiconductors because semiconductors are just about everywhere now in all modern electronics and diodes, transistors, microprocessors, solar panels and digital imaging devices like digital cameras are all semiconductor based and the semiconductor in question is generally silicon. To begin with we're going to look at some of the properties of silicon because on an atomic level these properties are important and tell us something about the PN junction and how it's constructed and from there we'll understand how all of these semiconductor devices function also. So to begin with, silicon has a crystalline structure held together with four covalent bonds. So you can see the atomic structure of silicon represented in a diagram there. And those silicon atoms are joined together by these four covalent bonds. A covalent bond is a term for the sharing of an electron. And so what happens in the, the silicon lattice in, in this um, construction is that electrons are continuously vibrating and moving around the structure and what happens is they're continuously breaking and forming new bonds all of the time. This is called electron diffusion and what we find is that the rate of diffusion increases with temperature. As the temperature increases these electrons vibrate more and break and form new bonds more regularly. To understand the PN junction, we have to first address the topic of doping. Doping is the adding of impurities to the silicon. We can add atoms which require more than four bonds or less than four bonds. A P-type material is an atom which requires more bonds, meaning that there are holes in the structure which require electrons to fill. An N-type is an atom which requires fewer bonds and has electrons to spare. N-type has an overall negative charge because it has excess electrons whereas P-type is positive. Let's have a look at a diagram which hopefully explains this a little bit better. So the P-type and N-type materials we see here are both largely silicon based but they both have these impurities added to them. On the P-type, we have a deficit of electrons. And so it's almost as if there are gaps that need to be filled by electrons. And we call those holes. And you can see those represented on the left-hand side in the P-type material. On the other hand, in the N-type material, again, most of this material is silicon. But we've added some impurities. And these impurities bring along with them excess electrons. And so there are free electrons in the n-type material which don't belong to a particular bond or lattice structure. So by using both P and N doped silicon we form this arrangement called a PN junction. The P-type silicon is rich in holes whereas the n-type has free electrons. The simplest example of a PN junction is a diode and we'll see how the diode behaves in accordance with what's happening here in the PN junction. Before we get on to that, we need to mention something called the depletion region. And the depletion region occurs in the center where the P-type and the N-type materials meet. Due to diffusion, electrons and holes will move around. We said before that this is linked to temperature and so the electrons are always vibrating and moving to form one structure, breaking structure and then forming another. And so electrons and holes will move around and combine to form complete molecules. 
this forms a region where there are no free electrons anymore. Any electrons that were free have been taken up by the holes or the, the, the deficit of electron to form a complete lattice structure. And so we end up with this region with no free electrons. And this is what we call the depletion region. The depletion region has high resistance because there are no electrons available for current flow. We've already mentioned the topic of diffusion. The diffusion being the vibrating or free movement of electrons. There's another force at play in the PN junction and this is what we call drift. Drift is the effect of atoms looking to retain their electrons or prevent diffusion. And these two forces compete against one another. Diffusion is encouraging the uh, electrons to move around, to vibrate, to form new structures, whereas drift is encouraging the electrons to remain where they are, as it were. So these two forces compete against one another. And this means that the depletion region can only grow so big. We can apply an external voltage to the PN junction. The direction of this voltage determines whether we are working with diffusion and against the drift, or we are working against diffusion and with the drift. Let's look at some examples. Here is a PN junction that's forward biased. We've connected the positive end of a power supply, a DC power supply, to the P-type region, and we've connected the negative to the N-type region. This means that we're working with drift and preventing diffusion. What happens here is the depletion region shrinks and conductivity increases. Remember the depletion region is the region of high resistance and prevents current flow. So the more forward bias voltage that we can add to the PN junction, it means that the depletion region is going to get smaller and that means the resistance is going to go down, conductivity is going to go up. On the other hand, we can connect our PN junction in reverse bias. So here, the negative uh, end of the power supply is connected to the P-type material and the positive to the N-type material. In this instance, we're working with diffusion and we prevent drift. In this instance, the depletion region grows and conductivity decreases. A PN junction is more commonly seen as a diode and what we find with a diode is it, that it takes a certain amount of voltage and forward bias to collapse the depletion region and allow current to flow. And we can see this in some simple experiments to observe diode characteristic. This voltage that's required is called the activation voltage and is generally around 0.6 or 0.7 volts. So the PN junction in the diode has a depletion region which, de which prevents current from flowing. We add forward bias voltage and gradually that depletion region shrinks and shrinks until current can flow. And generally it takes around 0.6 or 0.7 volts of forward bias voltage to accomplish this collapse of the depletion region. In reverse bias on the other hand the depletion region is expanded and current cannot flow. This is why a diode in reverse bias doesn't conduct current, but a diode in forward bias does. In forward bias we can see the characteristic in this graph. You can see voltage on the x-axis and there's no current to be observed for the first sort of 0.5 volts. But as soon as we hit 0.6, 0.7 volts, you can see that we must have collapsed the depletion region by this point. It's shrunk to the point that now current can flow. And so we see this nonlinear increase in current. This is an example of a nonlinear characteristic and is typical of most diodes. For resistive components, 
we would expect to see a straight line in this instance, where current and voltage are proportional. We'd end up with a diagonal line. But in semiconductors, this nonlinear response is more typical. So I hope you found this video useful. First of all, as an introduction to semiconductors and the PN junction, but then how that links to the function and characteristic of a diode. In the next videos, we'll be looking at Zener diodes, bipolar junction transistors, and field effect transistors, with a similar focus on their semiconductor construction.